And hello everyone and welcome back to the Pumpkin Copter Cast, the only video game show. And today we've got we've got two recurring guests once again returning together for the first time. Because you know, they just I mean Good luck. Ben's known me for a decade, so he he knows there's like no point in like trying to say no. And Carolyn is Yet to discover that, you know, I'm that one friend in every cartoon that convinces all the smarter friends to get into wacky adventures. Yes. Like, that is accurate. Yep. I'm like Hilda, Ben is David. And I'm not sure who Carolyn would be. I'm I just I always thought you were the funny friend because you keep sending those amazing Amazing, amazing Twitter, uh, Twitter jokes. Debbie has a lot of fun with uh, out of context Pokemon. Oh yeah, I love, I love out of context Pokemon. <laughs> I mean, it, to be fair, it barely makes sense in context. Insert obligatory super effective joke here. Yeah, I well, mean, like when I say that God is a horse, that's not like an exaggeration. That's a plot point in one of the movies, and but we'll get to that someday. Yeah, we'll save that for when Pokemon Legends Arceus comes out, or as I like to call it, Breath of the Why Not. <laughs> oh, that's God. That I'm I'm going to guess that in the next few years or so, that's going to be the name of an episode because they're getting more referency in the later seasons. Anyway. This is a video games show, and it's October at the time of speaking, and so that the four of us, the three of us, I mean, yeah, the four of us, there's that ghost that's been behind Ben this whole time. Um, what? Yeah, the three of us, in order to distract ourselves from the actual, from the actual existential horror that we feel every second of every day. We're going to be talking about video games that make us feel existential horror every second of every day. And, yeah. It's true. Well, especially with Resident Evil uh, coming out soon. I think that that was uh, Resident Evil's movie experience coming out soon. And then, you know, the getting all the really scary games in for Halloween. I think that's going to be... Uh... Yep. So, something, I can't remember who was on the show when I brought this up the first time, because, you know, time is a blur. Uh, but I think it was the first time, like, good, like, actual, I can't believe this is a real, th like, actual re friend I've made in real life and not just seen him on the internet, Chris Chipman. We talked about, you know... Like, not necessarily horror games, but games with horror stuff in it. So, Carolyn, is there any games recently that, or in the past, that you found that weren't horror by design, but have had stuff that, you know, just, like, strike you to your core even today? Well, there are a couple of games that I think are uh, really scary. You know, there's... um. Uh, uh, this the, these couple of games. There's a whole series where you have to face, you know, capitalist uh, invasion with uh, Stardew Valley and Animal Crossing. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I mean, Tom Nook is terrifying. Tom Nook, Tom Nook chasing you down, looking for that last bell, the that last uh, bell, uh, that last bell loan, so you can finish your stupid basement. Um, oh. let me see. Well, as far as games that have horror elements but that aren't explicitly supposed to be scary, I think I'm always going to lean into, like, you know... I don't... You know, I don't know. I don't know. All of my games that are scary have normally been just, you know, regular like regular games and regular gaming. I mean, maybe in cases where, you know, you get something that's a little more story oriented, like um 
um, you know, Detroit Becoming Human or something like that, where you have the the antagonist who sets up a particular storyline and then the characters, you know, the antagonist can be kind of scary. Like, you know, the, the, but that's not necessarily horror. When it comes to horror, I jump straight into the actual games themselves. <laughs> okay. I mean, for me personally, this will surprise no one who, like, knows me. And, you know, it'll surprise Ben even less, considering he's known me since my young, since I looked like, you know, a five-year-old version of Arnold or Janet from Magic School Bus. I mean, just way back in my little Big Debbie days, uh... When back in the ancient forgotten year of 2001, there's, you know, a little game that, you know, is just stuck in my brain forever is Paper Mario, which is on the, which is coming to, you know, the Nintendo Switch through the online stuff, which I'm excited for. <laughs> and just, I, just for context, I was eight at the time, but like in the third chapter of the game, which follows the second chapter, which is basically like, I don't know, what if Mario, but Indiana Jones, because you're going through a spooky ancient tomb. Like, you're called upon by a ghost to visit his ghostly mistress in the middle of a forest where ghosts happen. So you travel through the forever forest, which is just, you know, very G-rated spooky, but when you're eight years old, G-rated spooky is, you know, the some of the worst kind because it's the kind you're exposed to like you have to go navigate through like the forever forest which just loops around itself and in order to find out where to go so you don't like end up back at the beginning you have to like just click on the plants and some of them you know just do that creepy laugh some of them just like disappear mm-hmm. and, like that whole game that whole chapter is spooky because you end up spending time in like a mansion populated by booze and they make it known that they enjoy screwing with people because you know ghosts and you know just as they progress through the game and that like chunk of the game i think ghastly gulch or something it's just like everything is just like old and deserty and kind of dead then you go to like friggin you know I'm just like this probably one of the creepiest you know characters like in a Mario RPG because those ones kind of get really weird we got Tubba Blubba who is made invincible because Bowser who stole like the powers of the stars of heaven because you know that's how Bowser do like cut open like cut his heart out and like send it away somewhere and uh-huh. like I barely noticed it I didn't notice it like much before in the beginning but you know when you actually see Tubba Blubba walking around you can see like a little patch on him and you know it's really scary because in the up until like the very end of that chapter you can't hurt him at all so if he finds you you know you gotta run away and hide uh. and he eats the ghost and this like Again, just something you don't really think about is that, you know, you find out where his heart is and you realize that his heart is an independent organism because this is some Resident Evil shit. And you have to beat up his heart, who turns out to be an even tougher fight than the guy for whom the heart once belonged. And, yeah. And, you know, just... Uh, And, you know, before I go on to the other game that fills me with creeps ben do you have any like spooky honorable mentions Hmm. well it does feel a little weird describing a certain game as being the scariest i've ever played but since this one would technically be cheating anyway i might as well use this as an honorable mention as if not necessarily the scariest game i've ever played then certainly one of the most traumatic experiences I've ever had. Oh, One okay. that has permanently been seared into my memory. And that was when I think it was seven year old me who did this. It was when my dear old mom thought it would be nice getting me an N64 game as a gift based on a show that I was really into at the time. Uh. And the game in question 
was Superman 64. <laughs> Don't mock uh, me. I uh, still remember to this day the horrifying experience I had with the opening levels and everything you've heard about that game being an unplayable mess was absolutely true. That bit where I had to stop the cars from crashing into one another was one of the few times that I was driven to the point of anger-induced tears. And I do not get that easily frustrated, especially when talking about the other games are going to bring up that I would consider horror. So just think about that for a second, that someone like me with my infamous threshold for painful experiences couldn't even handle Superman 64. Just let that one sink in. But anyway, yeah. as for what I would consider actual horror, since <laughs> it is Nintendo and relatively recent, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that I have been playing a fair amount of Metroid Dread. Ooh, ooh, ooh. how is it? I'm not going to go into specific details, but I'll just say it is a lot better than anyone reasonably expected it to be. And it does get pretty intense. It's not just the fact that, you know, they boot you back to the old save point, but even by its own standards as a 2D action game, especially the part where you get chased by those Emmy droids, it does get pretty intense. And there's one boss fight later on, again, I'm not going to spoil it because it's recent, where it almost gave me Cuphead War flashbacks, but in the best way possible, if that makes sense. All right, all right, respect, okay. Um, no, that's, that's definitely on my list of must-purchase. But uh, I did something truly terrifying, something that might mark me among the greatest villains uh, of the age. Um, up there was uh, Freddy, Jason, Leatherface, and then me for spending money on buying Nick Brawl. Oh, dear. How does that make yeah. you a villain? If you buy <laughs> it's just bizarre. It's the most bizarre game. It's... You you have um, also there are some issues there there's some issues with uh, uh, compatibility and with playing you know uh, with how you play it because I think that there's some stuff that they definitely need to patch so you know jo joking aside because that was definitely a joke um, I think uh, I I was thinking about this and um, you you reminded me of the uh the honorable mention in horror games and i had to dig we got my guy over here remembering that uh, remembering superman and then um i had to dig back and the game that scared me the most as a child was the original sonic on the sega genesis yes with, don't tell me um, labyrinth zone yep oh okay. yeah and the concept and the concept of Dr. Egghead turning animals into robots. I remember being absolutely terrified by Dr. Dr. Eggman because his name is Dr. Eggman. Dr. Eggman, everybody. Dr. Eggman is a terrible person and I hate him and I hate him. And I remember being very, very small and being very upset at that level and being very upset at the whole concept of uh, Dr. Eggman. It could be worse. At least you didn't suffer through the entirety of Sonic 06. Oh, dear. Yeah. yeah that, that was kind of my last Sonic game, actually, playing that one. And uh, the, what was the wrong with Sonic 06? Oh, mm -hmm. Just, uh, it's a whole other train of emotional baggage that if I tried to unpack it, we would be here all night. Just, let's just yeah. say everything that you've heard about it is true and move on. Really? Okay, okay. Yep, right. so, <laughs> like, because it's Halloween, I'm slowly replaying what I call the giant-headed children experience trauma collection of games I have, which, you know, I'm 
Like a term I'm pretty sure was originally coined by Yahtzee Croshaw, but I'm going to steal it and make it my own. And, you know, he'll never find out because, you know, no one watches this. But, you know, I recently finished play, like yesterday, played Limbo, the original giant-headed child. is traumatized and, you know, it's still worth. Like, I forgot how, like, dead quiet that game is most of the time. You either hear, like, the ambient noise or just a little bit of, like, said giant-headed child, like, labored breathing as you run through all the stuff. Like, the spider. Everybody remembers the spider. Mm-hmm. And... I've never, I've never played Limbo. When you said giant-headed child, I jumped to little nightmares, but... Oh, yeah. Limbo... We will get to that. And then... <laughs> And then, you know, yesterday I started replaying Inside, which, you know, another another game by the people who made Limbo, which, you know, I was so excited when it was finally ported to Switch. Uh, and, yeah, it's just, again, like, ugh, they really, like, went the full, like, nine, y- nine yards because, you know, they took advantage of the 2.5D look so that when you're trapped in a sinister place, you can, like, feel the the vast emptiness. Like, there's a scene where, like, the people chasing the said giant-headed child, like, send dogs after you, and you just barely avoid getting ate by them. And it's just, it's friggin' awesome. And, oh, yeah. yeah. But... Yeah, you brought it up, and that is why I was going to bring it up, and it's, you know, I think these two games are, like, my first, like, genuine dip in the scary game pool, like, and, you know, like, the second installment, like, the, quote, second installment is, like, one of my games of the year, yeah, we're talking about Little Nightmares, the game, the franchise that I feel like has perfected the giant-headed children experience trauma, like, subgenre of horror i think it's, yeah oh sorry you go ahead. That, no i didn't even interrupt you i i was just i was gonna say it, it's funny that you know um that, that that there's always kids experiencing trauma is is such an easy part of of gaming because you know you you say that you say that it's your first foray but the other game that I was thinking about that made me scary, or that, that, that scared me as a kid that had some scary moments was uh, Lavender Town and Pokemon. Oh, dear. So, but no, that's... Uh, uh, Ash is a giant-headed kid. I mean, Red is Ash's spiritual cousin. He's still kind of still kind of trauma. You know? Uh, He's going yep. to make that big jump. There's plenty of... Oh, dear. It's just... Carolyn, wait till I, you know, force you to come back onto the podcast and we talk about some of the real creepy episodes. I mean, there's already the creepy episodes, like when Ash meets Sabrina. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Ash meets them spooky ghosts who are just, I guess, spiritual brothers to the Three Stooges, but we'll get to that another time. But yeah, just... Yeah, Little Nightmares is just like took everything that you know Limbo and Inside built, and they just took it, dialed it up to eleven. I think maybe part of it was because like whereas those two are two D platformers, like the Little Nightmares games are three D. So like if you're exploring a space. Like, you have to go, like, if you're exploring a room with a scary thing in it, you have to go to the foreground and the background to progress. And, you know, if a, if one of the scary things in that scary game is close to you, you can actually, like, the ambient noise or music just stops, and you can just hear the heartbeat of, you know, best triang- yellow triangle-headed girl six, who just, you know... I mean, speaking of horror, but, you know, we'll get to that. I mean, just the whole game is freaking terrifying. I mean, I just, yeah, just especially in, like, the beginning when it's only, 
And I, I think the completionist brought it up when he did his videos on it. Like, a lot of the game, like, you're in brightly lit rooms. Like, like the third chapter, it's just to give a little bit away. You're in, like, a sinister kitchen housed by two chefs that look like they're wearing what appears to be a burlap sack made out of skin on their heads, and you have to run away so that you don't get t- stuffed into, a, like, a, a food or something. Mm-hmm. It's just, like, none of, th- none of the things that may or may not be people talk. Like, whenever you get spotted by one of, like, the sinister staff and that evil boat, like they just make animal sounds, and you know, a little bit spoilery, but you know. And then the the fourth chapter of the game is just having having recently made the deci- the decision to watch it for some reason. Like the mo- like they remind me of, I think that, like the Mister Creos sketch from one of the Monty Python movies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like that that friggin' guy. Not just the fact that he's larger than like the human body should allow, but just like at the end when he eats all the food, like he explodes and then you can see like it blew out his rib cage and you can see his still heart beating and just like what if that was more than one person? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Have you played Have you played two yet, or have you just played the original? Oh yes, P- played it like the weekend that came out. Two Two is one of those games that uh, you don't. Oh, play so yet. good! <laughs> it was so freaking like. I think it was even like scarier than the first one in certain parts. Oh yeah, <laughs> where she yeah. just becomes the. Oh, no, no, I'm gonna keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Yeah, we'll save that for the game of the year episode. Um, yeah, but like just in the first game, seeing all this terrible, terrifying things that Six has to do or get away from is friggin' scary. Just because, as far as we know, she's just you know a kid with a yellow raincoat and no shoes in a place where. Like they're doing, they're kidnapping and doing any number of terrible things to the childrens, and you know, recently, I mean, just to add it, I like a few weeks ago, I recently beat like the prequel that is for some reason like, only on like phones and tablets, or very little nightmares, where you see like I guess way way back in the day of this like terrifying world. And, like, even though it doesn't have, it's, like, a slightly more, like, cartoony visual art style, it's, like, still has the scary things of, like, almost no music until something scary is on screen trying to eat you. It's just, like, ugh, like, but, yeah, two definitely, I think, is just a little bit scarier. Well, different kind of scary, because in one, I mean... Because which I don't count this as a spoiler since it's literally in the trailer. Um, you're stuck in this like you're stuck in this some dementedly sinister boat, and like almost all the places are some type of horrible confined space. Whereas in Little Nightmares Two, you're in like lots of big, scary open spaces. I remember like. When you get past, like, the prologue chapter and are into, like, to the real meat of the game, and you get to the spooky city, again, going, like, the bare minimum list of spoilers, like, all of the buildings look like they're, it's like in Inception, but right before, like, the part, the scene where, like, all of the building, where everything goes upside down. And, like, the buildings bend at an angle that everyone, even people who don't know how buildings work, know that that's not how buildings should be. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Um, Yeah, that's the scariest. And, you know, just, like, to pivot, like, for just, and, you know, just on the, the topic of certain types of spooky and 
I must like most people know where I'm going with this. In the most recent Nintendo Direct, there's a new Kirby game <laughs> comes out, and you know, just I would like to point out, like literally every single Kirby game since the series has been made, the final boss is some sort of horror, some sort of cosmic demonic horror from beyond like the realm of thought. Like a Kirby Star Allies is just like. I'm not going to give it away because it's just such a great reveal. It's just it's it's interesting. You know, some some of the games that I think are some of the darkest and the scariest are ones that are like meant for kids. I mean, no, any or at least they have some elements. They have some elements that are really grim, and it's like one of those few moments. I don't know if y- y'all were remembering, um, you know, when we were kids and you're watching TV and like some of the TV shows would just go. Because I've been on an Are You Afraid of the Dark kick. And watching some of the original Are You Afraid of the Dark episodes is just oh, an exercise in how oh, much do they let like... mm-hmm. and then But then yeah. you get like, you get, you know, Lavender Town, where it's like, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to resurrect this dead mother <laughs> Pokemon. Oh, what are we going to do? We're going to, you know, fight this guy who mutates little cute animals into robots oh what are we gonna do we're gonna defeat the cosmic forces of darkness and it's just like it it, it, some of the games that are the darkest are definitely you know there are obviously there are horror games and but then like we cannot discount that kid games kid games are a special level of horror yeah and Another game from when I was a young and that has just been seared into my brain is the second Paper Mario game which oh, yes. I will, like, one day when the game is finally ported to the Switch because my physical copy has been lost through a series of shenanigans of the most tragic kind, I will write that dang book about it, but, you know, that's a story for another day. But, you know, the thing that stuck out to me the most when I first played it as a young Big Dibby was, you know, the fourth chapter for Pigs the Bell Tolls. Which, you know, it starts right away when you get into the town, like, part of the game. Twilight Town. No, not that one. Um, <laughs> and just, you know, all the people look like patch. All the people are, like, patchworked. And, like, they're, like, they're, like, sh- they look like they're, like, in part of them. is like, shaded even when they're, like, in direct light. And mm. this- Like, it's just eerie. Like, all the trees look like they're dead, and they're surrounded by them big old blackbirds. And it's weird, like, when you venture out of the town and you get into the trail in order to get to the creepy steeple, in order to find out what why the spooky thing is happening, like, it just, I don't know. I gotta get me the Paper Mario games. I gotta get me the Paper Mario games. Yeah. Like, the... Like the music, like the music in the town completely stops, and it's just like there's even less music. I don't know, like just to like describe the fact that you're like traveling, you're starting onto the trail into like a deep, dark, spooky woods, and it's almost a relief when you find an enemy to fight because then the regular old fight music starts, and then you get into like the creepy steeple after traveling through like a spooky trail and then a spooky forest and then just like in the middle of it before you start exploring the place you see like a single boo just crying in the middle and you can't get in through any of the doors because then it'll be like hey where are you going and then eventually when you can progress that part of the game, like it asks you if you want to play and then it grows giants and then it just like spooks you. They're like, do you really? And then, you know, it gathers up all the booze that you unintentionally freed while exploring for treasure. And then it starts a mini boss fight. And then, you know, after that you get to like the proper boss fight when you climb to the very top. You Mm -hmm. find, you know, like, my favorite, like, villain character of the game, Dupless. There's a Dupla ghost, which is, like, literally a bedsheet ghost. As in, his body is literally a sheet. 
because you know that's how Nintendo do. Mm. And you know, like then you beat them, and you think, oh, you beat them, and you got the crystal star. Everything's fine. You can go on to the next adventure. And then you know, just the part that kind of screwed me up is that you know the screen is still on. You know the the purple shadow Mario that the spooky ghost man turned into. And then, you know, you press a button and then like, oh no, he turned you into the spooky ghost. And then he took over your body and none of your partners know who the crap he is. And then you have to walk. And it's like the first time in the game, you have to walk all the way back to town. But because you don't have any of your partners, so you're just walking alone, which just adds to the creep factor. Mm-hmm. And you know, then you realize that he didn't just take your body. He also took. He also like pulled a Yubaba from Spirited Away and took your name. As in Mario, literally can't say it because of magical shenanigans. And you know, then afterwards it gets a little better because you meet Best Girl Vivian, but it's still spooky for a good while. And you know. And even, like, the chapter before that, the wrestling chapter, they like, wasn't devoid of spookiness, as you realize. You know, you think the guy who signed you up for fighting was just a nice guy, and then you realize that like, he's basically, like, you know, and this is not an exaggeration, as anyone who knows wrestling will, can, like, couldn't confirm. He's basically... He cares for his people. He cares for the people who wrestle under him the same way Vince McMahon does. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, everybody never, knows. Never a good thing. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, you know. And someday in another podcast, I'll tell you about how, the, like, a monster in this third most recent season of Power Rangers is basically Vince McMahon but a space wrestler but anyway topic for another time but yeah there's just one scene where just before the boss fight happens you find like two of the fighters that allegedly resigned from like the tournament and you find them like behind in like a supply closet and you find them just you find them just like wrinkled and crinkled and like barely conscious and then one of the guys tells you to never go in the ring never go inside the arena when there's no one there and you know that was just general genuinely unsettling i was about to say the exact same thing that sounds unsettling (laughs) so yeah and then there's you know the final boss in that second paper mario game like, that was just horrible. That was just truly horrible. Like, they genuinely creeped me out when I was a youngin. Like, as I'm sure, like, Ben can also attest. Yeah, it was definitely an experience. And uh, funnily enough, all this talk about a 2004 era nostalgia for uh, abstract horror, it reminded me of my own similar experiences with another uh, beloved game that I experienced from that era. One that doesn't seem like a horror game, but definitely has a lot of those trappings in a, oh my god, I can't believe they actually got away with this in the context of a kid's game. And that would be Sly Cooper, namely the second one, Band of Thieves. I was definitely not expecting just how out there it got. Oh, jeez. Never mind the fact that the principal antagonist, Clockwork, is a giant owl, but he was so driven by his hatred of the Cooper clan that he <laughs> placed all of his human body parts with mechanical ones piece by piece, and that the central premise involves literally grabbing all of them, so it's like grabbing severed body parts. Ugh. But there's a specific point midway through. I'm not going to go into okay. specific details for like a 20-year-old game, but It involves breaking some very close friends out of jail. And in doing so, we end up stumbling across a vast criminal conspiracy involving, and I'm not making any of this up, double agents, hypnosis, good Samaritan brainwashing, and subverting an armed mercenary conflict in the middle of Prague. All in a game that is effectively rated E- for everyone. 
Yeah, Psy Cooper is dark. Okay. I've never played the Psy Cooper game, so this is news to me. Oh, yeah. you're in for a treat. It's one of my favorite franchises. Yeah, and the final boss of that game, it basically switches gears and turns into what I can only describe as a Kingdom Hearts-esque fever dream. Not that <laughs> the series is any... Not that the series itself is any less of a fever dream. And uh, sidebar, yes, I did almost cry tears of joy when Sora was revealed in Smash. Yay. You better believe it caught, like, damn near everyone by surprise because of, well, the horrors of getting the licensing agreement worked out, I guess. <laughs> That's oh, yeah. the real Halloween moment when Disney made you, when Disney had everybody sign that licensing agreement. Yeah. Uh... It definitely put a smile on my face. Like Thanos. <laughs> <laughs> That puts a smile. That puts a yeah. smile on my face. <laughs> oh boy! Well, speaking of uh, PlayStation horror games, since uh, we're also talking about what we'd consider our own game of the year picks, I might as well throw my own hat into the ring and mention one that I know at least one of you is going to hate me for this, and so will a good chunk of the people listening. Yeah. And that would be Returnal for the PlayStation Five. Oh, I haven't. I have yet. Th- like, gee, I wish I could play that. I wish I could play. I wish it was. I wish I didn't have to have feelings similar to the feelings I got when I beat, like, Super Meat Boy for the first time to, like, getting a friggin' PS5. Yeah, that's been a horror show in and of itself. And I said this before, but for those of you who are still struggling, believe me, you have my sympathies. And as weird as it sounds, I would say that Returnal is not the kind of game that would justify a PlayStation 5 in and of itself. If you're one of those people that's been praising, say, Insomniac for all their accessibility options in their new Spider-Man and Ratchet and Clank games, you could very well have your spirit and dual senses broken because this game is horrifyingly brutal. It's not just a fast-paced third-person action horror shooter game from Housemark, a studio that, by the way, their earlier work, Next Machina, big recommend. But it is also very hectic and overwhelming with enemies spraying bullets at you in such a way that it feels like you're being attacked by an army of oversized crunch berries. (laughs) But the kicker, for those of you who might not be aware, is that it's Housemark's first attempt at a roguelike, which means that the levels are procedurally generated, they're randomized, think something like uh, Spelunky, Hades, or Dead Cells, but also, when you die, you have to go all the way back to the beginning, and you can't even save your runs midway through, like a Dead Cells. Yeah. Genuinely terrifying, and, you know, if it ain't the hardest game out there right now, it definitely feels like it. But that challenge and that commitment to a singular vision at a time when so many franchises like Assassin's Creed and Call of Duty can pass on innovation with a simple palette swap Mm -hmm. is exactly why I love it so much. There's a certain point where everything clicks. I'm not going to spoil it, but it's like in the fourth biome. And you recognize what the recurring musical theme is when you're fighting that boss and you reach a sort of meditative Zen trance, like Mm -hmm. you stared into the depths of hell and came out on top. It was easily (laughs) the most phenomenal experience I've had this year. That's how I felt when I beat Cuphead for the first time. I do not just praise games like easily. I am very hard to play is like i even Mm. put a mario and a call of duty game in f tier for my games of the decade list i'm that cynical so just think about that yep uh i had that exact same type of feeling when i beat cuphead yeah and you know just you know going back to like actual like straight up horror games like a series I finally, like, decided to legitimately, like, dip my toe into, and, you know, like, I will event, I will finish it as soon as I'm, I finish these two other games on the list I'm looking at right now. 
Like I, like, I don't know. Earlier in the year, I recently started play, playing that game where you got to run from them, from them Zambi Rednecks or Resident Evil 7. Ooh, we, <laughs> and we, love, it, we love us some zombie Rednecks. Yep, and like, gee willikers. Welcome to the family, son. Oh, yes. Dear. Like, oh, jeez. <laughs> That's the best way like, to introduce her. Are you doing VR? Uh-oh. No, because I want I want to be scared. I don't want to have like I don't want to have to like, I don't want to have like to like eventually get a prescription for a migraine medication. Uh. And but yeah, was so friggin' genuinely scared. It still is. I'm about like again. I got sidetracked just because life and other games have happened. But you know just. I I don't know. Assuming like I don't I'm pretty sure I'm wrong just because I've never played like a full on Resident Evil game all the way through before, but like I'm pretty sure I'm on like the second chunk of it. You know, you just recently ju- recently beat quote unquote you know whatever Daddy Redneck's name is and now I'm running away from Mommy ah, Redneck. Redneck. Good old Jack, yep. Who's like, you know, just currently trying to make your face reenact that one scene in the Nicolas Cage Wicker Man with the bees. <laughs> and, yeah, and just, like, it's genuinely spooky. Like, oh, just, you know, it's like an essential part of survival horror, well, in my, from what I understand over the years, is running away from scary things. Solving puzzles that, you know, just unnecessary, just at times unnecessarily complicated, but it's Resident Evil. And, you know, Resident Evil is, like, written by that one guy who would definitely get eaten in the first ten minutes of a horror movie. And, you know, just taking what little ammo you have and shooting the friggin' zombie horrors and whatever they have that qualifies as a crotch. Or at least that's how I play the game. Especially when I get the shotgun. Yes, because it's they. Okay, here's the thing about the puzzles in Resident Evil. Because, and and Ben, I am sure. I am sure, sir. I am sure. I am sure, my friend, my new friend, that um, you want you can relate to this. Resident Evil is one of those wonderful games where, it's it's this blend of horror and traditional spooky, and corporate spooky because Umbrella Corporation is spooky. And then the creepiness of, you know, basic city bureaucracy. I don't know if anybody has seen the new movie trailer for Welcome to Raccoon City, but as a game fan, I was, I'm very intrigued, but also very nervous because you have all of these different, um, you have all the, you have all the, you know, all of these elements from all the original games that, that are missing in the, in the new ones, but the new ones are genuinely terrifying. By the oh, end yeah. of the original, by the end of the original games, by the end of the original games, it, there are parts of it that became a running joke because it's like everybody knows about Raccoon City and everybody knows about the puzzles in Raccoon City, but it comes, you know, in, and it's genuinely terrifying when you are in City Hall and you are trying to escape the zombie cops and you're looking for the various keys and the various anim- the various keys and the various jewels to try and get out of the area. But the the new ones are so much scarier because by the end and the longevity of the franchise, you're looking at Resident Evil and you're just imagining, it's like, hey, Bill, you know, we have to, uh, I got to go to the bathroom. Have you seen the uh, red jewel, the blue jewel and the green jewel? Because I think I have to put them in the, you know, I think I have to put them in and, you know, turn them a certain way to get it. Dude, we lost the green jewel. Are you serious? Are you telling me that we lost the essential green jewel? Yeah, you have to go down through like six basement levels and, beat the giant thing that's part brain part tongue dude all i needed to do was you know go that maybe get a bagel oh we lost the three dragon heads that'll lead to the bagel you lost the dragon heads that'll lead to the bagel how could you leave the dragon heads that'll lead to the bagel but yeah i mean just to know at times some parts of resident evil 7 like the some of the spooky parts in the beginning especially are just ruined a little bit just because I 
for I want to punch Ethan Winters in his stupid face because you know just like even in the get like it's not even just like a player like as the player you have to do the thing because that's how the game works is like even like like unlike a lot of other scary protagonists in the games that I've played, he actually reacts to stuff on his own, like in the cutscenes and out and everything. And he clearly sees some of the spooky stuff happening. Like he sees his wife to he sees his wife like ooze black licorice out of her freaking eyes and they you know, he gets his hand sliced off and then, you know, just as soon as he escapes from, you know, Daddy Zamble Redneck, you know, he gets a call from some mysterious lady and then he's like, huh charming i just i want to punch him like my goodness like i haven't felt this irrationally angry since you know my friend tom and i got to the episode of pokemon with seymour the scientist the most annoying one-shot character in the franchise i mean just like my good like it reminds me of like back in yet when yahtzee Crosha like, reviewed his favorite game, Silent Hill 2, and he talks about, you know, how James Sunderland just goes to the spooky town when he gets a letter from his wife who's been dead for three years instead of just running away like a smart person. And I'm just like, I want to... Like, I just want to punch him, like, right in his stupid face. If you need it out, then you can always go play Resident Evil 5. You literally punch a boulder during the final action sequence. Yeah. I'm not making that up. <laughs> Uh, so five, that, and, five and six are an exercise in wanting to punch not just the characters but the game developers though because five and six were terrible I'm sorry yeah. and if you um, want a real Resident Evil horror show say something even remotely positive online about the Resident Evil 3 remake that'll be fun uh, I haven't, I you, haven't you played that boldly. yet you live boldly my friend you live boldly look well, there's and, a and, you know, just a game that isn't really scary. It doesn't really fill you much with terror. Just, like, the, the opening act of it, just, it kind of just filled me with despair. Or at least I'm assuming that's the intention of the game. Like, I, one of the games I recently completed on my list of games to play that I'm looking at right now was Dragon Quest Builders. And I wanted to me it to mention it to you specifically, Carolyn, because, like... You're as much of a Marvel nerd as I am a Power Rangers nerd, so, you know, it literally is a what-if, as in, like, the most iconic, one of the most iconic moments in the first game is, you know, the Dragon Lord offering you half of the world in exchange for you not, like, you know, using your magical sword to just beat the shit out of him. And, you know, and like the in the game in Dragon Quest 1, you say no, obviously. But, you know, this priest is like, what would happen if you said yes? And having played through, like, the three games in what is known as the Erdrich Trilogy, and, like, having been familiar with all, like, the iconic locations uh, in Dragon Quest, like, there's, like, in each, like, chunk of the game, you get to, like, one of, like, the iconic towns, and there's, like, literally nothing there, because it's all been wiped out. And, you know, you just find journals of, like, other people who have been traveling, and you hear them just, like, slowly succumbing to, like, the horrible monsters, or, like, maybe turning into the horrible monsters, and, like, it's generally a pretty cheery game, because Dragon Quest is basically like power rangers taking like the power of optimism and literally you and literally not metaphorically literally beating up despair and depression and sadness with like a hammer mm -hmm. but yeah like that opening bit was just like real spooky as now that i have like the context for it oh it, well okay if we're talking about games I don't know if, if anybody else wants to go, but if we're talking about games that are, like, genuinely scary this year, and you're either talking about games that are, like... What did I play recently? I played... Well, we're gonna... There, there is a game, there is a horror game, and I will be the one to mention it, because at this point, the uh, the horror in it is less 
the games themselves and more the story behind them. And I'm pretty sure my poor friend Debbie knows where I'm going with this. But this year was both the rise of my love in uh, Five Nights at Freddy's and the fall, decline, and abject destruction of my love in Five Nights at Freddy's. And the fandom itself experiencing the real horror of will Five Nights at Freddy's security breach ever actually come out? And is it a real game at this point? Which seems like such a fitting, weird, I don't know, like, not purgatory, but like... Existential nightmare? Yeah, because it's the the game. It's the first free roam Freddy game, which I think a lot of people have always wanted because, you know, normally in the games, you're chained to a desk and you don't really get to invent. You get to in, you don't really get to investigate. Like You have to investigate on, you know, offline and you have to, like, discover things that you can do on the desk, but you don't get a lot of the actual story and all of the things that you've seen for Security Breach are just look really really fucking good like they look you know really spooky and the animatronics look great and any game and you know any game any haunted video game with audio animatronics is just right up my alley it could literally just be oh it's haunted Chuck E. Cheese and I'd be like yes hello give me three t-shirts and where's the PS5 so I can play the haunted Chuck E. Cheese game please um and but, then Scott Cawthorn had to ruin it by being a filthy garbage person. Yes. Mm. And then Scott Cawthorn completely shattered my sense of self and all this thing that I had really come to enjoy. And one of the only good things, the, the two things that I carry with me about it are the fan games. Because the fans have made games based in this world. And if I close my eyes and I send money in their direction... Like, say, something called The Walton Files, which I absolutely adore. It is not a game, but I believe the creator is trying to work on the game from it. And then there's, like, um, there's another indie game that just came out called Applehead. And it's these weird genres of games that are, like, corrupted video games. And I know Mm -hmm. uh, Applehead is inspired by Walton Files. It has to be because it's the exact same sort of look and feel and it's you know what hap- what would happen if these ghosts possessed these games what would happen you know if, in addition to the robots and uh I, you know debbie bef- when the night is out when when we're done with the podcast i'm going to send you a link to the game just just to a quick playthrough so you understand what i'm talking about because it's, uh. it's, awesome. it's not it, it's such an awesome genre and it, it's really difficult to describe because fnaf has become so commercialized and it's just so everywhere and is just totally tainted by Scott Cawthon Coth- being just, just awful. And it, it, it and I feel like at this point the release of security breach has become both this this punishment of the man and the punishment of his fans for allowing it. Because it's like, does this game really exist? This game looks amazing and it looks like it's gonna solve all these questions. But the person who made it is such a monster. <laughs> and everything that he did in the fandom, just embracing it, is just so awful. But So the game is just stuck in this perpetual limbo. And it's just like, oh, I want it. But also, I, I never want it to come until, I don't know, maybe, maybe, once, the, maybe once people reckon <laughs> with the world, maybe then it'll come and it'll... Somehow, I don't, I don't freaking know. I just was like thinking when I think of scary, I jump into Walton Files at this point rather than FNAF. But nobody knows the really amazing indie games that fans make connected to it that have that you know Scott Cawthon doesn't make any money on, which is the key for people who really don't want to support people like that. E- even if that person steps away from the franchise and you still buy merchandise, you're still supporting the person. Because they still get money from their copyrights. So even if you say that you're not supporting the person and then the person goes away, you're still supporting the person because nobody's going to give up a copyright to something that everybody loves so much. Just saying. That's my my spooky two cents on copyright law. Yeah, and like Ben mentioned it to me before... Well, we were, like, earlier in the day, we were talking about the games that we were going to friggin' get, but hold on. Let me see if it... 
there's a quote that I feel like is appropriate. I got to see if it's actually here. Uh, hold on. No, no. No, 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 no. Uh, let's see, is it actually? Uh, uh, nope, can't find it. Uh, whatever. But, you know, we all know that. Uh, you know, the one of the games that like Ben automatically brought up when talking about scary is, of course, you know, the second most recent thing that from software has come out. <laughs> we were talking about, you know, Bloodborne, like, which yes. is basically what if Dark Souls, but literally everything everywhere was filled with jelly. Yeah, really red raspberry Viscous jelly. jelly. I don't know if Tyler told you this, Carolyn, but I've sort of developed a reputation over the years as being uh, both a FromSoft stan and a blatant masochist, like going out of their way to be Cuphead on expert mode masochist. <laughs> why would and you do this? Why are you, why are you that bold, sir? <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, isn't it obvious? Because I like hurting myself. I guess so. And that was definitely an experience uh, back in 2016. It's not like I was unaware of his reputation, but I was one of those people that sort of appreciated it at a glance, but I never thought in a million years that I would ever play it. But, you know, 2016, just got out of grad school, had a little money for finishing. So I figured, why not see what all the fuss was about? And yeah, there were definitely some growing pains. I actually still remember uh, having to get extra bottles of painkillers because it was grinding my teeth so much the first couple of bosses. <sighs> but it was the second one in particular, Father Gascione. And if any of you have beaten that game, or actually that fight in particular, you know the point that I'm talking about where he basically loses his shit it goes absolutely feral. The first time that happens, it was just, like, permanently seared into my mind. Like, that game does not pull any punches in terms of the aesthetic or the difficulty, but, like, with Returnal and Cuphead, it never gets, you know, perfectly un... like, completely unreasonable. Like, I played a fair number of games where the difficulty can get a bit sadistic. Like, uh, I'm sure you, Debbie, can recall your own experience uh, with, uh, what was it again? Uh, Mega Man 11 on normal mode, that Freeze Man stage, made oh, you put the game on ice for a couple of years. <laughs> yes. Well, just, it, well, just to go on a completely non Halloween related rant, it's the same freaking problem I have with freaking Sonic Mania or like the Crash Bandicoot the Insane trilogy. And that, you know, you know, part of, like, bringing, remastering old games or giving new additions to, like, franchises that were a thing back in the day is to use, the, like, the modern conveniences of, like, gameplay technology and just gameplay advancements. But they have the friggin' live system, which doesn't add anything to the overall friggin' experience. It's just, like, how was, you know, giving yourself an artificial number of tries... And then if you die again, you have to start all over the beginning and beat that level again, even though you already friggin' beat it. Like, you know, just Mega Man 11 became finally playable when I realized there's an endless live mode because, like, like Sonic Mania, it's too much like the old thing. Even though it has new graphics. Like, God, that, that wasn't so much fear so much as it was, you know, rage. And since all three of those were often compared to Dark Souls, man, that Crash Bandicoot becoming Dark Souls meme was so surreal. That means they technically classify as horror, albeit more in the creeping existential sense. Yeah. But getting back on topic, you know, they weren't kidding when they said Bloodborne got super creepy and chaotic. I'm doing my very best not to spoil anything here, but believe me when I say that 
it really is an experience that sort of transcends convention and whether on PS4 or PS5, it's not something I would immediately recommend, but if you do go into it with a lot of patience and a willingness to uh, expect the unexpected while maybe bringing a spare pair of pants for when you crap yourself, it's <laughs> definitely worth a look. Yep. And then... And then, you know, just... And, you know, then later on, you know, everyone's, you know, Ben's favorite undead baby, literal man baby thing, the Orphan <laughs> of Koss, has been lovingly adopted by the Debbie family. And I still, I still love that. I still love, I still love that whole a, image that you painted with that. A, <laughs> a beloved, a beloved baby brother to... To little Debbie, and you know, to the point where I actually just like made like I, like I've been making D and D character sheets for all of the members of the Debbie family, and then I made one for what I, I call them now is the Debbie of Cos, or some would say Cosm. You know, at some point you're gonna have to actually beat the Orphan of Cos boss fight yourself, right? Think of it as I, going through the adoption process. I uh, yeah. I don't, I just, I do not, I just hate that style of game. I just, I like, everything in, like, the Dark Souls and Bloodborne game just feels, like, so dang slow. I just hate, like, every, like, for every animation for everything feels like it takes an extra second, which, when you're doing it a bajillion times, is a lot. So, you know, just... Yeah. I just, and I, I fondly remember what you told me when I got you the Switch port of Dark Souls Remastered as a birthday gift. All you said was, and I quote, thank you for the present. Also, how dare you? Yep. <laughs> and I'm only half joking. It's not actually a prerequisite, but who knows? Maybe if we actually get a Bloodborne PC port from Sony, things could change. Could. No. No. Like, I, no. It's no, not, she it's says not no. The, I, it's not the fact that the game is difficult. It's the fact that the game, like it's the controls, are structured in a way that personally irritating to someone with my state of mind. So clearly, there's a limit to what each of us has on what's considered uh, too horrifying, which is fair. Horror, like comedy, is subjective. I mean, I'm the kind of person who didn't flinch at once watching uh, Joker or uncut gems in theaters, but I digress. Hmm. Now I'm now you have me thinking about my limit as far as as horror goes because when I was a kid, you know, when I was a kid, the 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 natural impulse I was scared of Darth Vader, and I was scared of you know egg the, uh, egghead, and I was scared of um egg egghead eggman. I can never pre remember his name correctly, and I was scared of Lavender Town, and you know there were all these vaguely unsettling things. But as an adult, I was forged in the fires of Resident Evil and Silent Hill and, you know, the horror, the horror, you know, the, the, the entire survival horror genre. And it's like, now I'm trying to think, no, you know what? Bioshock. <laughs> oh yeah. Bioshock was that real scary. Yeah. Bioshock, not even, and it, it's not even the concept of the game. It's not it's not the concept of the game because I can handle me, you know, weird mutants and I love I love me some, you know, corporate corporate commentary and, you know, capitalism is bad intrigue. And I love the, the whole thing is freaking gorgeous. No, no, no. It is the jump scares. Uh. The jump scares for Bioshock were so well done. I remember I was living with a friend of mine at the time and it was like something like two in the morning and she was asleep and I was, you know, staying in her room and I was playing. Bioshock, and I remember I was in one of the water grottos, and they had the splicers that can like, like disappear and reappear. The oh, magic ones. I remember ones. that. And the whole, the whole time. Sorry, my my you know device that I'm recording on had a moment. The the whole time I'm watching, you know, and I'm just like, oh, this is great. And at about two in the morning, I'm looking at a wall. And this shadow just appears behind me. 
and I scream really loudly. And my friend who is literally sleeping behind me wakes up and she's like, what, what happened? What's going on? And I had to explain the, the, the splicer got the jump on me. So now I'm thinking, and it's like, what is a game people I am recording with? What's a game with good jump scares? Oh dear. I mean, Fire some... second, but it had one. Oh yeah. And you know, something I like found out just relatively recently is the the guy who played Andrew Ryan, Armin Shimmerman, also played Quark in Deep Space Nine. Which no, many people are, you are like, That's perfect casting. Yep, that was him. That, oh my god, that's amazing. Uh, no, good good jump scares. I can do unsettling, mm. I can do horror, I can do gore, I can do dead space. You know, none of none of the things that traditionally horror phase me except for jump scares, apparently. And it's like, but even with Resident, like it, that's why seven was so good. And that's why eight was so good. Well, eight eight was good because of everything about the world building and Lady Demi, the Demitrescu. Let me do Demitrescu. 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 The queen. <laughs> the queen. Someday. The queen. Anyway. Like, um, but uh, the no, the seven just has the best. When the mold things come out of the wall, it's like seven has such good jump scares. A oh, good game yeah. has good jump scares. Let's see. Uh, yeah, there's there's a good few in Little Nightmares too. That again, I won't give away since it's still relatively fresh in people's brains. But let's see. I mean, hmm. I guess bits and pieces of Limbo. Limbo is more just crushing sadness rather than scary. Mm-hmm. But you know, the part, the spider, is you know pretty like. I think one of the things everyone associates with it, like inside, like like this is not a joke. The first for like the first I don't know hour or so I played inside the first time i genuinely thought like the game was based around you know a kid escaping from a concentration camp because you know at and relatively early in the game you just see a bunch of just randos just being forced to walk in a procession by these weirdos who either don't have faces or are wearing masks and they're forced to stand in line for some horrible experiments And, like, the kid is the only one with actual, like, color on his shirt. So, and then there's, like, all the scary things that want to eat you. Uh, no, no. Yeah. Let's see. Sorry, now I'm looking for, now I'm looking for the the game with the kind of jump scares that actually get me to to jump. So, bear with me a moment as you folks, you lovely guy, you lovely people talk about your loveliness. And yeah, but let's see. I'm not sure if it's a jump scare, but like a jump moment would be just you know, this is the only spoiler I will give for the original Little Nightmares, which I think is like on sale everywhere for like dirt cheap. It's like the it's the the last part of like the second to last chapter of the game, where you know. As we all know, as anyone who's played the game knows, that six is a hungry girl. And, you know, one part of the game, the gnomes, these little pointy hat headed people, one of them just like gives you a sausage. And you think you're going to eat the sausage. And then the freaking music changes. And then six freaking just sinks her teeth into the thing's neck. And you're wondering, like, where the crap did that happen? And then you realize, like, just what the title of the franchise actually means. Okay. I found... I found it. I found the game. I'm not going to give you that playthrough, because that playthrough is really, really long. Um...
All right. Okay. There we go. There, copy. All right. When you have a moment, dear friends, check out Andy's Apple Farm. Oh, <laughs> that's the kind of that's the kind of jump scares that I'm looking for because those jump scares are just deeply unsettling. Mo ha 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 ha. But they don't have a necessarily like a full on trailer for it, which is kind of frustrating. But in any case, um, so yeah, jump scares are what I need to be scared <laughs> at this point. All right, and oh, when I finally finish playing, you know, zombie rednecks the game, and. I go to, I'm sure I'll be equally scared when I get to Vampire Mom the Game. Vampire Mom the Game is, is both scary and also just, just wonderful. I mean, it's scary, it's scary, but I also, it, sometimes, the, and this is a thing with Resident Evil, is that sometimes, and I, I'm sure that, that, I am so sorry, Debbie's lovely co-host, I cannot remember your, your name, it's Ben, right? Yeah. Ben, I deeply apologize, that's very rude of me. <laughs> It's fine. No, it's it's not. But but Ben, I'm sure you can relate. The, the the thing with Resident Evil is that you have all of these lovely characters that go with the scares. So you're like, am I scared or am I just really interested in seeing where Big Boo Vampire Lady is going next? <laughs> am I scared or am I just really interested in finding out what's going on with character X, Y, and Z? And, you know, they're genuinely terrifying characters, but they're also so interesting. You know what I mean? I do not find Lady Dimitrescu even remotely sexy. Oh, I don't find her sexy. I think she's interesting. <laughs> well, there goes my attempt at a jump scare up in flames. <laughs> evil, evil SpongeBob laugh dot gif dot I have no idea how to really relate to people. I won't lie. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah. It's basically it for me. Yep. And, you know, doubt. before we. Hold on. Before we sign off, something we never got a. Ch I never got a chance to, you know, force Carolyn to participate in the previous times they've been on the show. Carolyn, it's time to play the game show that I made up on the spot one day. It's uh -oh. time to play. Yu-Gi-Oh! or Dark Souls. Oh god. Okay. This is, this is a real jump scare. Yeah, Ben, if you helped him in any way, I would like to remind you that, you know, I, I, I will hunt you down like an animal. Yeah, so no phoning a friend this time. Yeah, um, so I'm going to say, because, like, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Dark Souls have one thing in common, is that, like, like all the characters have names that sound like if you stabbed the dictionary and it bled all over the floor. And so I'm going to send, I'm going to read the name of a thing and you have to tell me if it is Yu-Gi-Oh or Dark Souls. All right. All right. This is the real jump scare people listening at home. This is the real jump scare. I was not aware that this was happening, but I live, I live. Uh, you, you cannot frighten me, Debbie. Let's do this. Okay, well, let's see. Just... Hmm. All right, we'll start. Just look at the Yu-Gi-Oh cards that I have at my computer desk at all times. And my list of Dark Souls bosses. Uh, how, many, how many rounds? How many rounds do we get? Just three, because any more it'll just be a lot. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's see. Let's start with this one. Let's see. Okay. Armatile the Chaos Phantasm. Yu-Gi-Oh! Yu -Oh. 
Oh, damn it, you got it. Uh, it's like, what if a, it's like, what if a kaiju could somehow get more anime? Is the only way I can describe it. And let's see. Okay, next round: Moonlight Butterfly, Yu-Gi-Oh, or Dark Souls. Dark Souls. Uh, yep, you got it. Really? I would have said I. It was a that was a tough one because I literally was leaning towards Yu-Gi-Oh, but then I was like, all right, we're just we're just gonna go for the dark horse here. Damn, damn. All right. Okay, and let's see the next one, the last one. Let's see. Zushin the Sleeping Giant, Yu-Gi-Oh! or Dark Souls? I can't phone a friend. No. Yeah. Okay. And knows the games too well, so it wouldn't count. Okay. Sleeping Giant. Yu-Gi-Oh! You got it. Are you serious? I was legit. Th- no, I'm. I'm not even. I'm not even <laughs> fucking joking. I'm not even joking. I legit was going Dark Souls, Dark Souls, Dark Souls. And then I'm like, no, I'm gonna go Yu Gi Oh. Damn. That's a good game, Debbie. Damn. <laughs> oh my Lanta. Uh, Thank yeah. you for playing that with me. That was great. All right. Yeah. And with that, we come to. The end of this Halloween Say Word Talks edition of you know, the Pumpkin Copter Cast. I would like to thank Carolyn and Ben for joining me, definitely of their own free will. Always. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, you know, yep. Before I finish up and plug any of my stuff, Carolyn, is there anything you want to shamelessly plug? Um, as always, I am on Twitter at at Carolyn C A R O L Y N N I N Fandom F A N D O M. We all know how that's spelled. Um, I am still. I've been writing. I wrote a piece for Collider on Loki, but I have been unable to do anything recently because of personal issues and real life issues including the the trauma yet amazement yet excitement of working for disneyland's avengers campus so if uh you happen to be the i guess the biggest thing i can plug at this point is if you happen to be heading down to disney's california adventure come on down by pim tech industries because with pim tech test kitchen we're wanting to grow with you and no that's totally not a reference to anything creepy it actually isn't it just sounds really creepy but we made it up as a slogan for our fan for uh nerdy you know cast memberness so we want to grow with you yeah and ben is there anything you want to plug uh apart from being my usual passive aggressive self about encouraging anyone to get good eh, not really although i will say per your recommendation i did download the uh, little nightmares games and i'm uh, looking forward to being spooked by ps5 ray tracing Ooh. Ooh. i definitely know what that is and uh, so yeah if any of you have enjoyed this show You know, like, rate, comment, subscribe. Be sure to hit the little bell icon so you get notifications when I actually post things because everyone loads extra steps, YouTube. And, yeah, if for whatever reason any of you with a spare dollar want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash thepumpkincoptercast where for as little as a dollar a month you can submit questions for me to use in, in future interview episodes. And when I'm not doing this, I'm with my host, Tom, and we host Gotta Recap Them All, where God is a horse, so nothing is off limits. 
and we ver- are basically watching every single episode of the Pokemon anime. Which let's see, let's let's just see just how Sisyphean the task we have on us now. It's the current episode count. Hold on, number number of Pokemon episodes. We have reviewed, at the point of me saying these words, 82 episodes over a period of a little over two years. And there are currently 1,115 episodes. And that's not even, and that's not even counting the fact that there's over two dozen movies. And you know, several of those animated specials, which again, Carolyn, I will Shanghai you into. Yes, I am here, be- to, especially because I didn't realize I I knew it's a big big thing, but I did not realize how much of a Sisyphean task you were under. So Debbie, yeah. I'm 150 percent with you on that. You know, you can always invite me to things. I mean, at the very least, I'll show up and I'll be happy to ramble and have your co-host go. Wait, what? Yep, just. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're currently on the Orange Islands arc, which coincides with Pokemon the Movie 2000, which I basically just confirms the fact that Ash is literally, you know, horse god's chosen child. But, you know, yeah, we'll get to that on the podcast. So, Ash's dad is horse god. <laughs> it turns um, out that Ash's dad is horse yep. god. That's that's like... Ash's. Ash's dad is horse god, and according to Pokemon, not only is God a horse, but God is a non-binary horse. And I'm I'm saying that just on the off chance that the podcast becomes popular enough that we get the weirdos who hate stuff like that for no reason. Anyway, as I say at the end of every show, have a gourd day, everyone.